In 2021, when I posted my two-part episode on the career of Carl Long, I received some comments saying that I didn't properly cover the period of Long's career, from his fine in 2009 to his return to the Cup Series in 2017. They're right. So today, before we move on to John Carter, we're going to turn back the clock and finish this story. Included is not only a brand new interview with Long, but another with Craig Partee, one of his team owners from that period. So sit back, relax, and as if by divine retribution, they return from the brink of extinction in even greater numbers. They aroused anger in some, admiration in others, but each new 2004 was their chance to rise. They were the Field Fillers! In May of 2009, Carl Long left Charlotte with two blown engines and a damaged race car. He'd then be told that his race engine was 197 thousandths of a cubic inch too large, for which NASCAR handed down a record-setting series of penalties, a $200,000 fine, 12 race suspensions, and 200 driver and car owner points, all for a team that didn't qualify for a points-paying race all year. After an unsuccessful appeal, Long couldn't pay the fine and was thus prohibited from racing in the Cup Series. NASCAR did not prevent Long from continuing to work as a crew member for Front Row Motorsports, where he was already on staff at the time of the penalty. Interestingly, it was Long who helped broker the deal for Front Row to acquire the shop formerly used by Mach 1 Incorporated from 2004 to 2005, and by 2009 he was part of the flagship number 34 team which was competing full-time for the first time with driver John Andretti. Long could also still compete in both the Nationwide Series and the Truck Series, so set to work in both divisions. Even during an economic downturn, Long managed to find work at small teams with up-and-coming sponsors. Well, with, with me, I, I'm the driver, I work on the car, I drive the hauler, uh, you know, and, and, and so it was all in one, and you know, and if you didn't have any drivers bringing any money to the table, then someone like me, you pay me one job and I did five. So I'm more efficient. And and that's how I got to drive the, the cars is because I worked on them and, uh, and, and, you know, just like a crew member would be. Among those he worked for was Corey Stott, daughter of 1976 Daytona 500 pole sitter Ramo Stott. Corey's team, Stott Classic Racing, began fielding Nationwide Series cars for Andy Ponstein in 2008, yielding a best finish of 33rd in Kentucky. For 2009, they entered Ponstein in a few Truck Series races, along with Dylan Oliver, Danny Efland, Charles Lewandowski, Steve Park, and Terry Cook. Joining the team as sponsor was the Coma Unwind Chillaxation Drink, a melatonin-infused beverage designed to offset the many energy drinks dominating the market at the time. The product was created by Daisy Ramirez, owner of the Potencia Energy Drink Company. Born in Honduras, Ramirez would in 2010 bring this sponsor to her own truck series team. In their debut at Daytona, both Ramirez trucks not only qualified, but also led laps and finished strong. Carlos Contreras took home 14th, while J.J. Yaley picked up the team's best-ever finish in 10th. Long was instrumental in getting the Ramirez team up to speed so quickly. You know, what I have done in that whole time was help people build race teams that didn't know where to start. And oh. then after they got started and they got stuff going, just like James at J.G. Hill, after they got stuff started and they used up what I knew and could put all that stuff in and uh, hired a new crew chief, well, the crew chiefs had other connections and all of a sudden, you know, they didn't need me anymore. My value was not as good after after you already got something started and built. It's just like, you can't build a car. Okay, I get the car built. Well, we don't need you no more. But Ramirez continued to need Long's help. In fact, gave him his first chance at racing since the penalty. On May 2nd of 2010 at Kansas, he qualified 35th and led a lap before engine trouble left him 27th. He then impressed at Dover, nearly besting Yaley's Daytona run with an 11th place finish on the lead lap. In all, he'd make 10 truck starts that year, 7 for Ramirez. 
Around this time, Long's crew chief Morris Van Vliet got him in touch with a friend of his who wanted to field cars in the Nationwide Series. He always was lighthearted and kept uh, ha a happy beat and uh, always positive and always kind of interesting when you go out to dinner with him, all the stories and just the stories he would tell and from all his years of racing and just different people he'd met over the years and whatnot. Craig Partee was 16 when he and his friends welcomed NASCAR back to Watkins Glen in 1986. He immediately pulled for Rusty Wallace in his white Pontiac 2 Plus 2 with Kodiak Bear on the hood. A few years later, Partee tried his hand at racing. He competed in SCCA events on various road courses, then worked for Tony Vecchio's Bush North Series team. While learning how to race in SCCA, Partee would also help out on crews across all three of NASCAR's National Touring Series. In between, he developed a construction and excavation company and later developed a brewery and cidery in Seneca Falls. Both businesses carried the name Fleur de Lis, a reference to the emblem on his family crest as his father's ancestors came from France. In 2010, when NASCAR prepared to phase in their car of tomorrow in four races, Partee saw an opportunity to start his own race team. Morris Van Vliet got him in touch with Long, and Fleur de Lis Motorsports set up shop in Van Vliet's building at 802 Performance Road in Mooresville, just behind the Mooresville Dragway. Preparing to run only the four COT races, Partee chose car number 68, represented as 168 in the owner points a deliberate choice to represent 168 hours in a week. On June 1st, Partee purchased a former Dale Earnhardt Jr. car from DEI and assembled the new body, which remained a plain white. Automotive Specialist Racing Engines provided the power under the hood. The team announced their intentions on June 7th. Um, yeah, we decided that would be a good time to start, even though the economy was bad at that time. Uh, we figured because it would be fair for everybody with everybody going into that one season with the first four races, or not first four races, but the first four races with that new style body of the car. Uh, so we figured we had a good shot of uh, being competitive with everybody else since everybody was in the same boat that year. Um, and then uh, Carl was driving uh, on a couple different truck teams at that time and was available, so we got him to uh, drive. Plus, he had the uh, tractor and then had a friend that had a transporter that we could rent and stuff and the, and the equipment to go do those uh, first four races that year uh, and then lead us into the following year to start doing our own thing. After putting together their car in less than a month, Long and the Fleur de Lis team found themselves in good position to make their first ever race, the car's debut at Daytona in July. They were the 44th entry for 43 spots. They still didn't have a primary sponsor, but did receive some backing from Marrow's Truck and Welding, A-plus Plumbing and Heating, and the Garlic Garage. Fleur de Lis' own branding was also on the car. Long ranked 40th in qualifying, but fell just over two tenths off Mark Green for the final locked-in spot, sending them home early. The difference was a dragging cross member, which required a suspension change that hurt the car's aerodynamics. The cross member was relocated after Daytona, allowing Long to qualify 31st for the August 14th race at Michigan, sending home Johnny Chapman in Morgan Shepard's car. Long also finished the race in 31st, completing 119 of 125 laps under power, this just 11 weeks after the team was even formed. Long also got the team into the September 10th race at Richmond, with backing from Millennium Fuel Energy Drink. This drink was the brainchild of Vince Vecarino, CEO of Millennium Air Private Jet Charters. Despite an overheating engine and brake issues that put them behind the wall, Long returned to the track. His was again the last car to finish under power, turning 207 of 250 laps. Even with the dual challenges of starting a new team with a new car, the Fleur de Lis team never had any issues in technical inspection. No, we were always really good in tech, um, normally first time or second time through, if worst case, and I always had a competition going with uh, one of my friends that was the uh, car chief over on uh, Stephen Wallace's car on the Rusty Wallace team, so we were always in competition every week who could get in the tech line first. Uh, so that was always kind of a friendly uh, battle every week to uh, see who could get through tech first and get past. Millennium backed Long once more for the team's return at Charlotte in October, Long's first laps at the track since his penalty in 2009. In the final practice session, he put up the 24th fastest lap. Iridale County Animal Services and Control Department and Wholesale Direct both joined as sponsors. The qualifying proved a nightmare. On his first timed lap, Long spun off turn four, restarted his lap, then spun again in turn two and hit the inside wall. 
Only after the wreck was it discovered by the broadcasters that the team had left the cow cover over the hood, costing them speed. Long joined Morgan Shepard on the short DNQ list. With Partee's team done for the year, Long entered three more races with Fred Bickford's team, making one more start and park effort in Gateway. Heading into 2011, Long and Partee planned to run full-time in the Nationwide Series, as a long-awaited sponsor planned to sign with the number 68. This sponsorship would have allowed the team to buy 10 cars from Roush Fenway Racing, which was selling them to upgrade their fleet. When Partee's sponsor fell through, Larry Gunselman looked to buy the cars, just as he had when he and Roush worked out a similar deal when Mach 1 Incorporated returned to cup competition in 2004. Only now, Gunselman worked for Rick Ware, who was two years into his return to the Nationwide Series following a five-year absence. Among Ware's drivers was Timmy Hill, who made three of his seven Arca starts in 2010 driving Ware's cars. Timmy's father, Jerry Hill, helped finance the purchase, securing Timmy his first full-time effort in NASCAR. Long, who both raced for Ware in all three of NASCAR's top series and raced against Ware in late models back in the 90s, came on board as both mechanic and one of up to three Starton Park teammates to Timmy Hill. These extra entries allowed Ware to maintain a weekly payroll for his 10 to 12 employees, a key difference from when Long volunteered at Fleur de Lis Motorsports. I'd build a car and take it to the track and get it set up and get it racing good and then that one would move on to one of the primary cars and I'd put another car together and, and carry it there. So we started off a couple numbers on them and, and that was just, they wasn't designated to be starting park cars but that's, you know, with limited budget, that's what we did. We we qualified a car and, and pulled it in pretty quickly and, and took the tires off of it and what money that it brought in from the, the income just went in towards the team to help make make the car roll the whole year and that's you know or the whole weekend help pay the expenses and that's kind of the business model that i had while long was now spending more time at rick ware's team he had worked out a deal for Partee's number 68 car to be brought to the track on ware's hauler in place of a backup and though a full-time sponsor still failed to materialize the number 68 did receive some backing from glidden professional and the iron horse saloon to drive, Long also recommended an up-and-coming Matt Carter, who would impress Long around this time. Carter would share the ride with Long, Tim Andrews, and Chase Miller. All this allowed Fleur de Lis Motorsports to enter 12 of the season's first 17 races and qualify for all 11 they attempted, excluding the withdrawal of Carter at Dover. But much like Long at Ware, the number 68 was now a start in park, never turning more than 18 laps and never finishing better than 36th. Even then, Carter gave the team its best ever qualifying run by taking 20th at Michigan, a moment Partee recalls the team's best moment as they outqualified both of Rusty Wallace's cars. Well, when Craig went to the racetrack, Craig went to race. But Craig didn't have, you know, so he'd, he'd get his sponsorship money up and get his stuff together and, and put, you know, all the lotmen in it. So it was fun to go drive with Craig because you knew you were going to go race with Rick. Timmy Hill had money or somebody else had money and and I didn't but I was Rick's mule basically for building cars and setting them up and going to the racetrack and getting them in the race and driving the hauler but it was a paycheck I, I, I I'm not retired by any means I have to work every day to make a living so that was my job to make a living Partee planned to return for the fall race at Kansas with Jeremy Petty as driver with sponsor Burwell Construction but withdrew for a second time that season. And while he wanted to return in 2012, continuing sponsorship issues forced Partee to shut down the team at season's end. Long continued to work at Rick Ware Racing for nearly three full seasons, balancing his roles as both mechanic and a part-time driver of the team's spare cars. His 2012 season was nearly the same as 2011, nine starts where he never turned more than 27 laps, nor finished better than 37th. He made another five starts in 2013, and for the first time ran a full race in one of Ware's cars. This occurred at Fontana, where he came home 30th, five laps down. Coma Unwind had rejoined him as sponsor that day, nearly three years after Daisy Ramirez shut down her Truck Series team. During this same period, Rick Ware's team reached some important milestones. In the 2012 Daytona 500, Ware returned to the Cup Series for the first time since 2006, Mike Wallace failed to qualify for the Great American Race. 
The next month at Las Vegas, Timmy Hill qualified the number 37 point.com Ford 42nd in the field of 43. It was a massive accomplishment for Ware, which came after at least 25 DNQs or withdrawals from cup races dating back to 2002 when Long was his driver. The 2012 Nationwide Series season also saw Hill score the team's first ever top 10 finishes, taking 7th and 9th in the two Daytona races. Hill would soon team up with Frankie Stoddard at the Go Fast Racing team for a bid at Sprint Cup Rookie of the Year in 2013. Long, meanwhile, would also explore options outside of Rick Ware Racing. At Kentucky, on June 28, 2013, he drove for Mike Harmon and finished 28th. He made some more starts for Harmon later that year and got to know his brother-in-law Greg Mixon, who had also been business partners with James Whitner. Whitner was anxious to start a race team of his own, and Long was once again helping a new owner break into racing. As it happened, Long had purchased a couple Dodges from Penske Racing, a team that had just made the change to Ford after Dodge pulled out of the sport. Long rented another shop, which became the first headquarters for what was called JGL Racing. Whitner was a listed team owner of JGL, with Mixon as general manager and Long as competition director. Long would also drive one of his two Dodges, running alongside first Mike Wallace, then J.J. Yaley. The team's flagship number 28 impressed early, with Wallace taking 13th in the team's Daytona debut, then Yaley running 7th that spring in Talladega. James wanted to go really big, really hard, really quick, and, and basically they just used me to to buy the cars, to buy the people, or to, to hire the people with my knowledge and get stuff together. And it never was any intent for me to become a full-time driver with James Whitener. It was just use me up for what I had and use my race cars <laughs> and, you know, and pay me for a job. And, and I always just wanted to drive, you know. Sure. But I, I understood the business side of it. And uh, J.J. Yaley came along and he had some money that uh, could – put sponsorship with it and that's when I kind of met JJ and, and Mike Wallace I had knew him from doing stuff with Rick Ware and uh, and I brought Mike Wallace over there and I also brought uh, Matt Carter uh, to the deal I think Matt's one of the best race car drivers that had never really got a chance to get up there and go but they they spent a lot of money they went on the Gibbs deals and they was just going way faster and James wanted to wanted me to sell him all the stuff that I had. And I was like, no, I mean, I'll let him use my race cars. The car that JJ Yaley finished seventh with at um, Talladega is my Dodge. It's, it, and, and I changed it to a, a Toyota. I still have it in my fleet today. During JGL Racing's ascendancy, Long was still relegated to the team's start and park driver, denying him an opportunity to capitalize on the top tier Penske equipment he'd just purchased. That didn't change as Whitner expanded out of Long's shop to buy a new one. In fact, he now wanted to buy Long's cars outright. But it's like this, it's, if, if you're a mechanic and, and you're working for a guy, but he's determined that he wants to buy your box of tools, how, why do you sell it to him? Because that's your box of tools. Well, I'll let you use your tools as long as you're here. Well, I, that's the way I looked at my race cars. My race cars was my tools and my ability to make a living. And I had saved up and got enough to build a couple of them that I owned myself. And I was not going to let myself get in a position where all of a sudden I had no race car and um, and I couldn't go make a living. Um, I, had, uh, I had gotten into that position a few years back. I had bought a car and built a car and kind of went into partners with a guy and he sold a damn thing on me yeah. and oh yeah 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 it was and i never got to race it after i spent most of the money to buy it so i had to go through courts and then i spent more money on that going through the judicial system to try to recover what was mine but race cars don't have titles and all that stuff so oh, i just goodness. got yeah so i just got screwed over Disenchanted with JGL, Long returned to the first shop he'd helped the team acquire and took over the lease. He also made sure to bring back his two Dodges, one super speedway car and one downforce car, along with the equipment he'd run for Matt Carter. There, Long formed his own business with two other drivers who had started teams of their own. One was John Jackson of Scotland, who 
since 2011 had run the number 72 Chevrolet in the Nationwide Series. Jackson had backing from attorney James Carter, who, as the listed owner, placed his website CrashClaimsR.us on the team's cars. The other was Derek White, a Native American racer from Quebec, who ran his own entry, the number 13. In between his starts for JGL in 2014, Long had driven for both Jackson and White, and at one point again ran Daisy Ramirez's sponsorship from Coma Unwind. The three racers soon decided to join forces. So, heading into the 2015 season, Long's two cars were joined in the shop by White's three and Jackson's two, forming Motorsports Business Management LLC, or MBM. Building on the successful business model at Rick Ware Racing, White, Long, and Jackson were among the 15 drivers who raced for MBM in 2015. Both White's and Jackson's sponsors stayed with the team for years, including OCR Gasbar and Braille Battery from White, and most noticeably the crash claims R.Us backing from Jackson. White was MBM's listed owner until March 2016, when he was arrested and charged with smuggling tobacco, leading to White's indefinite suspension from NASCAR. Just last November, more than seven years later, White's conviction was overturned, citing existing treaties between Native American tribes and the United States. Long took over team ownership and first looked to rehire Matt Carter, as some of the equipment he brought back from JGL still fit the driver. But Carter had retired from racing to take over a business called Statesville Glass, so Long secured Timmy Hill, who White had brought onto the team part-time after his go-fast racing deal ended in early 2014. The result has been an ongoing business relationship that continues to this day, even as Timmy and his brother Tyler have themselves embarked on team ownership in the truck series. I haven't had to get unemployed over the winter. You know, as soon as the race season season's over, you get laid off because they don't want you no more and, uh, or you get through. None of that happens. And that's been one of the things I've been trying to do as my race team is I try to keep my employees hired all winter long. I don't lay them off as soon as the race is over. Now, I got a bunch of them that used to like to go out in the bushes and go hunting and they take the winter off and that was great. But we're here right now putting cars together and I really don't have a big budget to do it with. But but I built up all this stuff, all of the ideas and all of the stuff that I wanted to do that, uh, and I would have done it for somebody else, but, uh, you know, it just didn't, it didn't materialize that way. And so that's why and, uh, MBM was created and what I'm doing now. It was only after all this that Long secured Cup cars from the closing H. Scott Motorsports for his return to Cup competition in 2017, again under the MBM banner. After uh, nine years of being out and, and a new regime coming in and different people, they looked at it a little different and said, okay, you know, we'll we'll allow you to come back over here in Cup. You've, you've, you know, basically, uh, since I couldn't pay the fine, I went to jail for nine years. And, I, and then I was in NASCAR jail for nine years and couldn't run in a cup side. And then when I was able to run in a cup, <laughs> we spent a whole lot more money than what they find me, you know, just getting to the track. And um, But yeah, the, the fine, it, it, it didn't go away, but they said the nine years of not being able to race uh, was probably more than enough punishment. Much of what followed is already covered in part two of this episode, focusing on the efforts of Carl Long's team up to the current day. As MBM continued to operate, they outlasted other Cup teams, including Premium Motorsports, which Long discovered also ran the same H. Scott equipment he'd purchased before. They also outlasted JGL Racing, which scaled back after James Whitner had health issues. But there's one more story that's been left out and needs to be told. On June 26, 2020, Craig Partee and his crew at Fleur de Lis Construction were working on a friend's property in Rochester, New York. It was a Friday, and Partee was looking forward to attending the upcoming race at Pocono. Before that, he had to complete the day's job of dismantling a barn so it could be relocated and used as a garage. Built in the 1800s, the barn was 30 feet wide, about 44 feet long, and two stories tall, not including the basement, where on this day Partee was preparing some chains. Then, from somewhere above him, he heard the roof shift, 
then a commotion outside. Somebody yelled that something was shifting and all of a sudden you heard it crumbling and it's like, and I wasn't really sure where to run to because it could have been worse. So I was kind of in the middle of the structure. So that's kind of where I stayed. I just kind of crouched down and hoped for the best. Craig survived the collapse, but by the narrowest of margins. He could see daylight through the debris, but was trapped under piles of timber. His legs were pinned, his ankles fractured, and he felt the weight of a beam against his right shoulder. He could hardly breathe. The collapse had punctured his lung and nicked his liver. It took all his strength to call out to his crew. Um, basically, when I was under there at first, when it first happened, I was yelling to let everybody know that I was alive, that I wasn't dead underneath there. And then I'm not sure how long, but then I basically kind of blacked out from either stress or lack of oxygen because of the uh, punctured lung. He regained consciousness an hour later, now surrounded by first responders who had somehow made it down to him, two firefighters, EMTs, and then the local county sheriff. The team used airbags under the building to lift the debris just enough to pull Partee free and put him on a stretcher. A crew from Mercy Flight Central then airlifted him by helicopter to Strong Hospital, where he spent 10 days in the ICU. Miraculously, aside from some pain in his feet, he made a full recovery. Uh, it was a little bit of an uphill battle. A um, year later, because I, I had torn a bunch of tendons in my one foot, so I had to go back in for tendon surgery a year later and get that fixed. And that was probably the worst part of the ordeal, being uh, without being able to use my uh, foot for like eight to ten weeks. Ever since that day, Craig Partee has stayed in touch with his rescuers, many of whom also serve as the standby crew for the NASCAR races at Watkins Glen. He has also been an outspoken advocate for training the next generation of first responders. If it wasn't for the first responders, I pretty much wouldn't be here today. Um, because if it was, wasn't for them, I wasn't getting out of there by myself. I mean, I was basically trapped and pinned and, you know, I could move around, but I couldn't get free or I couldn't. I mean, I could see daylight at the other end because the barn had kind of stayed up enough in the middle um, from the roof. But I just, I was, without them, I mean, I basically would have been dead. It just so happened that at the time of the accident, Partee was planning to return to NASCAR. After Fleur de Lis Motorsports shut down, he had sold much of his equipment to Victor Obica, but remained in touch with Carl Long. By 2019, Partee bought an Xfinity Series car from GMS Racing, which shut down the number 23 entry, previously run by John Hunter Nimicek. With this Chevrolet, Partee planned to enter it in his home race at Watkins Glen, where his old team had never competed. He'd hire a driver, save on an owner's license would partner with an existing Xfinity team. After his dramatic rescue, Partee decided to dub the car Second Chances. The Chevrolet would carry both logos for Mercy Flight Central, plus the helicopter tail number of the crew that saved his life, November 911 Sierra Mike. Partee was still recovering when the 2020 race was canceled due to the pandemic, so efforts turned toward 2021. There, he reunited with Carl Long, and under the MBM banner, Timmy Hill drove second chances to a 29th place finish. The three reunited for another run in 2022, and this time Hill did even better, taking home 14th. Partee then became a mechanic for Jordan Anderson Racing, where in 2023, Anderson returned to competition following burns suffered in his frightening crash at Talladega the previous fall. Partee didn't enter his car at Watkins Glen that year, Jeb Burton's number 27 did carry Partee's tribute to all first responders. This included the crew that had also airlifted Anderson from Talladega, two of whom, 63-year-old Mark Gann and 43-year-old Samuel Russell, died in a helicopter crash that April. Burton finished a strong 10th. As of this writing, MBM has amassed three tractor trailers and over 60 race cars, even a next-gen car, which required hundreds of hours of manpower to prepare for the 2022 Daytona 500. But struggles in recent years have caused Long's team to scale back from 47 employees to only five. I asked Long what his fans can do to help MBM stay in business. Personally, they can't. You know, I'm sure that most of my fan base isn't able to write a check, but if, if they're involved in a business that can help like you know some of the sponsors that we've got like like wild willies is one of our guys that come across and they're a beard product and stuff like that i mean they can uh, send a letter to the the sponsors or generex generex is a really good one with ryan newman you know they can 
they can send asking for hero cards and asking for a, a little something or their support. But you know, the, the thing is, if if a fan looks at it and goes, "Oh, I'm," I see this Wild Willie stuff. They're they're not in our store, and maybe they're in a department store. You know, uh, maybe they're in something like Target, and but they're not in Walmart. But you got somebody that's a brand manager for a. We we've actually tried. Chad Fincham was trying to work with them to get them in Food City because Chad has a connection at Food City. Okay. So we were trying to get Wild Wild Willie's into Food City, but it uh, I don't really know where. I think it's still working. It just hadn't. It hadn't finally come to the end yet, and then, um, you know, we that kind of stuff. You know, any any business to business relationships that some fan could probably help me with, that would be fine. But more than that is just show support to the people that are already sponsoring us, so that they know that what they're doing is working. This leads us back to the next episode, which also happens to be a team Carl Long drove for about the time they were filling fields in the NASCAR Nextel Cup Series. exists a sport that is driven by the fans. They are why everyone works so hard on the teams and at the tracks, in front of the grandstands and behind the scenes to give the fans the greatest race possible. NASCAR fans deserve the best, starting from the high banks of Daytona all the way to the shores of California and at every race in between. NASCAR fans, you're the reason for our success. Thanks.